slides are blank this morning, so that's, uh, uh, they're working at that. Um, but at the, at the outset here, uh, a reminder of what we're on about here. Jesus has been um, traveling since chapter 9 of Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 51, and the journey is from uh, Capernaum and uh, the Sea of Galilee and the region that we call Galilee, uh, and he has traveled now down the Jordan River, through Peria, through Jericho. We've traced the journey through those places, and he is now in the city of Jerusalem. Now, the, 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 we left the apostolic band last week in the upper room, uh, the Last Supper. So, um, the, the, during Holy Week, Jesus' movements uh, day by day are kind of traced out in the Gospels, and certainly the sequence of events in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is pretty much the same. John sometimes has a different sequence, uh, but that's common for John. John, John, they call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic Gospels. They can be seen together. You can put Matthew, Mark, and Luke beside each other, and you can see the general storyline is the same, but each gospel writer has perhaps other details or some episodes that the others don't have, but they're all, they all read together. John has his own timeline, and most folk believe, most scholars believe, that John's timeline probably isn't, was, timeline wasn't important to John, theology was. So John is telling the story of Jesus, uh, the light of the world, and he probably has resequenced things in order to work the story, in order to accommodate his theological convictions. Um, and uh, so we're following Luke's story, and uh, uh, the events of, the, of Holy Week, the traveling about the city of Jerusalem during Holy Week, the, the, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and even John, are almost all lined up. Um, so day by day, from Palm Sunday, when Jesus makes his triumphal entry, uh, until you know Easter Sunday, we've kind of got a timeline. Uh, and uh, some of the questions I got last week after uh, after uh, the session indicated to me that I probably would be wise to create a handout, which I will do for next week, that sort of shows the timeline in a, on, on paper, what happened on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, just to kind of lay it out. Um, so, and I'll do that for for next week, God willing. Basically, during the first, uh, uh, during the, so Sunday, Jesus makes a triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and, uh, and he's staying in Bethany with his friends Mary and Martha and Lazarus, uh, whom he has raised from the dead. And on the, the Sunday, he makes the, the triumphal entry. On the Monday, he goes back the same route. He goes back to the temple and he teaches. And on Tuesday, he goes back to the temple and teaches. On Wednesday, we're not entirely sure, but it, he, he may well have gone back to the temple and, and taught, or he may have he may have taken a day off. Um, on Thursday, he goes back into the uh, into the city of Jerusalem uh, with what we talked about last week: the prearranged signal, following a man with a water jar to an upper room that's furnished and ready for the Last Supper. And there, Jesus uh, shares the Last Supper with his disciples. Do I have slides yet? No. Okay, I'll just keep. Ad libbing. <clears throat> so the, the, the Last Supper that we discussed last week was really a Passover meal. And Jesus is shown in all the synoptic gospels, and all, all of them, as the new Moses uh, leading a new exodus. And we worked over that a bit last week. It's not about deliverance from the enemy Egypt. It's about deliverance from uh, sin. And Jesus does something at the Last Supper, at the Seder meal, which had a set script. But the set script, Jesus interrupts in the middle, and he reinterprets the meaning of the Passover meal to, to basically say, not only am I the new music, Moses. Now, he didn't say this in words. This is what, the, the, what we're to take from it. Not only is Jesus the new Moses, but Jesus is also the Passover lamb. Now, that's a radical twist. Um, his body is to be broken and his blood poured out. So Jesus is both the priest and the victim at, at, this, 
uh, sacrifice that he reenacts, that he enacts in the upper room. And instead of being saved by the angel of death by having the blood of a lamb put on our doorposts, we're saved from uh, eternal death by Jesus' blood poured out for us. And this memorial meal that he gave us is the way we reenact that. Remember last week we were talking about how um, Jesus did not give us a theological treatise uh, to explain all of these things. He didn't write a paper and he didn't give a long speech. Jesus gave us a meal. And every time we re-enter, uh, every time we break bread together and share the cup, we re-enter the story. And the big word for that is anamnesis. It's, it's, it's a bit like the word we get memory from. But anamnesis is more than remembering. Um, that's why Anglicans don't like the idea of the communion being referred to as a memorial. We, 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 it was a memorial, but it was more than that. What we do on, at Holy Communion is we somehow re-enter the Last Supper that Jesus shared with his disciples uh, on Mount Zion in the upper room. We re-enter it and we remember it and we, we reenact it. And by doing that, we, we paint on in layers the story of Jesus' death on a cross and his resurrection. And that's why the architecture of our churches always has a pulpit and a, an altar, a Lord's table and a, and a place where we proclaim the word. And the, and the logic of that, the theological logic of that is there are two aspects to the way that the church grows into the gospel. We grow into it with God's word proclaimed and read, and we grow into it by reenacting the Last Supper week after week after week, and by those, doing those two things, we paint it on in layers. How are we doing, Rachel? Hallelujah. I, I probably need to log out and log in again, because it's telling me I, I can't see. Let's just see if when I change slides, it changes. No, it doesn't. So I'm going to log out and then lock in again. For Gethsemane. And it's going to ask me if I want to. I didn't ask the question this time. Okay. It's not. I'll, I'll back up and let you get me in. Thank you very much. Hey, Rachel, you got that right. So I have done... The, so I was talking a little bit about the toing and froing. That map is just not big enough. Um, the lower line shows Jesus' uh, route that he's following today. From the bottom left corner, where, where, where the bottom left corner, that thick red line, is the upper room in Mount Zion. And the line leads to the foot of Mount, the Mount of Olives, which is where the Garden of Gethsemane is located. So the meal concluded, they go to pray. And uh, let me show you some pictures. So just a few pictures. This is the Mount of Olives halfway down the slope. And this is, again, the view from halfway down the Mount of Olives. At the bottom of the hill that we're on there, uh, you'd find the Mount of Olives. And then the Kidron Valley, that green patch, which is mostly graves these days. And then you enter the city, uh, the walled city. And this is the Temple Mount. Just remember, this is where Jesus has been teaching for the past, uh, uh, during the week. This is the Kidron Valley. And uh, the... Kidron Valley is filled with uh, cemeteries. On the eastern slope, it's all Jewish graves. On the western slope, it's all Muslim graves. And in the middle, there's a stretch that is all Christian graves. This is the Christian graves. My, um, let's see, my great-great-grandfather was in the Holy Land during the Crimean War and had a, he, was a, he was a surgeon in the British Army. And uh, one of his children born in Jerusalem was buried in one of these graves. Uh, so I, that's why I was sort of interested in looking at that Christian grave site. Um, 
At the foot of the Mount of Olives is um, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, the setting that we're in today. Gethsemane means olive press. So it's a place where a whole bunch of olive trees are growing together. Olives represent a huge part of the uh, Palestinian income. The, uh, the people who uh, uh, lived there always made a living from olives. It's, a, it's an amazing, uh, powerful uh, crop in the sense of its many uses and its great value. And olive trees live to great age. The olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane are more than 10 centuries old. Uh, that tree you're looking at is more than 1,000 years old. And uh, they just keep, uh, and, and of course, they are always replanting and replanting. So these trees we're looking at were probably not the very same trees as Jesus, but they're trees that are grown in the same ground from the same rootstock. We're, you're, and you know you're in the right place because this has been the vineyard, and the vineyard, the, 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 the olive grove, um, is on the path from Bethany to Jerusalem. So this at the, is exactly where it's told, the Bible says it should be. And there's a great church there. Um, I love hanging out in the garden. We used to be able to walk around these paths. Now it's kind of fenced off. Too many pilgrims were wanting to take a snipping home <laughs> and the uh, olives were being denuded. So that's the church of all nations built over the site of the, gar of the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, the architect, a guy, an Italian guy named Barlucci, designed the building so that it would help us to get into the, uh, the mood of the Garden of Gethsemane. But every time we go there, Carol and I have our picture taken on this rock out front. So we've got this series of pictures <laughs> with us gradually aging over the years. Black hair giving way to gray hair, giving way to no hair and all that sort of stuff. Um, oh no, I got blanks. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, good. Then I'll go back. So uh, that's inside the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, the Church of the All Nations, and there's a, a communion service underway. And uh, in front of the altar is the Rock of the Agony. Uh, and I have a better picture of it here, I think. So that piece of stone surrounded by an iron grill made to look like a crown of thorns is, has always been believed by the faithful to be the stone where Jesus was weeping uh, you know, and, and, and sweating blood in the garden, the story we're going to hear. The, the reason that we know these, some sites in the Holy Land we aren't too sure about. There are places that are pretty obscure, like um, uh, Emmaus. We're not really sure where Emmaus is. But there's other places that we're quite confident in, and this is one of them, because from the earliest times Christians would gather there. And when Christianity became legal in the third century, Constantine sent his mother, St. Helena, to the Holy Land, with a whole pile of money with instructions, find the places and build churches. And so in the third century, a, built, a church was built on this site by St. Helena at the location where the local Christians were gathering to uh, remember Jesus and his agony in the garden. So this stone was the center of the third century church. I mentioned Barlucci, the Italian architect. He tried to make it look like dark in there, so the windows are all purple. And the natural light comes in through purple windows, stained glass windows. There's not a lot of incandescent lighting. And so the whole church has a feel of being in a place uh, at night. Um, and again, another of the olive trees. And another view of these olive trees. So, just hold on a second. You're almost ready to read, Mary, but not quite. Um, so, the Passover meal has concluded, and Jesus and his disciples are still in the upper room, um, and Jesus is in torment because the disciples, at the end of this Passover meal, he has given them this memorial meal, this time to enter into um, the events that God is bringing about in the world, and, and this great, important um, 
spiritually significant moment, and at the end of it, the disciples break into an argument about who is the greatest. And it's like they just missed it one more time. Now, I don't have time, and I'm not going to read that art part today, but I, I, most of you have been reading Luke with me. And in Luke chapter 22, 24 to 30, is the story of the dispute about who is the greatest. What I want to say, just before we move into this next section, today's teaching, is to think about this argument that's going on among the 12. Um, it's not so much that they're arguing to see who. They don't, it's not like they're vying for first place. It's more like they're arguing about which one of them is the one that will end up being the leader. And they're, they're talking about power and prestige and titles and, and that, all that kind of stuff. And Jesus is internally distressed by this, and we, we can see that. Um, it's a spectacle. Trouble like they have never known before is about to befall them. Um, the team needs to be at its best if it's going to survive the trouble that's about to sweep over them with Jesus being crucified. The greatest challenge of their lives is before them, and the stakes are huge. Jesus does not want his disciples to be arrested with him. He wants them to continue so that the gospel can be proclaimed. So the church has to survive his crucifixion and carry the message to the world, and for that, the 12 have to be a team. Um, but they're bickering like football players before a game, perhaps, arguing about when they win the game, which one will get to hold the trophy in the, in the, in the press release. Uh, and Jesus is brokenhearted. Um, and he speaks to them about servanthood ministry, but it would appear that they don't really get it. Jesus has been among them as a servant waiting tables during the Last Supper, turning the world's ideas of leadership on its head. And amid all this pettiness, and here's the point I'm trying, I want to draw, Jesus is displayed by Luke as being lonely or all alone. Jesus is teaching, his heart is breaking, and nobody seems to get it. And Jesus is shown by Luke in his... Um, passionate desire to share his life with the 12, and they're just preoccupied with, with stupid stuff. So today, uh, we begin with Jesus foretelling Peter's denial. Let me just tell you before you hear the ver verse that when he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded of you that he might sift you like wheat, the first two yous are plural. So it includes all the 12, and I think it includes us. But the next you, but I have prayed for you, is a singular you. So it's intended to talk about Jesus' particular prayer intention for Peter. Mary, please read. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. This is then Jesus' second attempt to get the team ready for the trial ahead. Remember, after they're disputing and bickering about who's going to be the greatest, he teaches about leadership. That was his first effort at getting the team on the same page, and he's shown to be kind of alone. So this is Jesus' second attempt. Um, as I've mentioned, the first two yous are plural, and then it becomes singular. Peter, Jesus is interceding for in a particular way, and he's confident that his intercession will succeed. You notice he says, um, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Jesus doesn't say, if you will turn again. Satan's after all of us. Satan's after the 12, and he's particularly after the leader. That's always the case. 
But Jesus' intercession is vastly more powerful than anything the enemy can do. So Jesus already knows that Peter's going to deny him three times. Jesus already knows that in the end, his intercession to the Father for Peter will be successful. But it's still important that Peter get the point and Peter understand what's going on. Um, Jesus needs Peter to understand that in the trial ahead, leadership is critically important. Peter, in the strength of the Spirit, will be able to give the kind of leadership that the church needs. But it's essential that he grasp that in his human nature, and relying upon his own human strengths and abilities, he'll never pull it off. Peter may be bold and brash and confident, but that will simply not be enough. The same is true for us today, isn't it? Leadership in the church is about uh, not about our strength of personality. It's not about uh, anything but Jesus and his spirit helping us to become and be what we, what we need to be. Jesus wants Peter to understand that in the battle ahead, he will most certainly, despite his best intentions and best human efforts, he will fall short. But Peter is all bluster and self-assurance. Again, we see Jesus very alone. This is the second effort at kind of getting the team together, and it doesn't seem to work. It's almost as if Jesus decides, this man can't hear what I'm saying right now, and he won't hear what I'm saying right now. So I'm going to give him a sign so that as these things transpire, as they unfold, the penny will drop eventually. So Jesus says to Peter, Peter, I tell you, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. So Jesus is here planting a word in Peter's heart that within a matter of hours is going to come true. And we'll see next week that when that happens, when the rooster crows, Peter knows in his heart that everything Jesus ever said to him is true. There's that. It, so Jesus is using a prophetic word to make sure that his message to Peter gets through, even if it doesn't get through here in the garden, it'll get through tomorrow. The prophetic word will be fulfilled in graphic and auditory detail the next morning. And then Jesus seems to pivot. He tries a new way to get through to the apostles about the crisis that's about to sweep upon them and how they need to be in unity. Listen again to Holy Scripture. Scripture must be fulfilled in Jesus. Luke 22, 35 to 38. And he said to them, When I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, Nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords, and he said to them, it is enough. So Jesus asked the 12 to call to mind a time, the times, when he had sent them out. And there were two of them. There was the time he sent out the 12, that's told in Luke chapter 9, verse 6, and the time when he sent out the 72, uh, Luke chapter 10, 1 to 20. I'm not too sure which, uh, I don't think anybody's sure which, or perhaps both, uh, of these times Jesus is referring to. But he has sent them out almost empty-handed, depending on the generosity of strangers and the goodwill of the people. And how did that work out? I mean, it worked out perfectly. They acknowledged they lacked nothing. In the text it says, but now. Put three lines down on the screen above. But now. In the, in the Greek, 
you almost, those but now would be in kind of bold, all, all, all capitals underlined. But now the Greek phrase emphasizes the, the contrast between how it used to be when I sent you out the last time and how it's going to be now. We're in a totally different world right now. Um, at that earlier time, Jesus, I think, is saying, I had temporarily defeated the forces of darkness, and we had friends everywhere. The gospel message was going out. People loved what they were hearing. The opposition hadn't rallied as it has now. Now, we don't have friends everywhere. We have friends, but we have more enemies than friends. And I'm about to be taken from you. He says, this is an evil time, and the forces of darkness are closing in in great numbers, in power, and you will be facing a hostile world with little or no external support. And Jesus will not be in the flesh with them. Now, we know that Jesus will be with them by the Holy Spirit, but it's a little different. It's like the little girl that uh, was praying about uh, she's afraid and can't sleep, and Daddy says, don't worry, Jesus is with you. And the little girl says, but I would sure prefer somebody with skin on. You know, <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, you want to have Jesus with you, right beside you. Not, uh, not, yeah. And so Jesus is talking in pictures. They seem to think he's talking about a literal fight. They, they miss the point. He is not suggesting that they need to arm for battle and all run out and buy swords. Jesus is trying to use word pictures to describe for them a world that's hostile to the good news of Jesus, hostile to the message of Jesus, in which what they're used to won't apply anymore. It's a new and different world, and if there ever was a time you guys need to be a team, it's right now. So smarten up. That's sort of the message. But they, Jesus' comment about swords is what we would call exaggeration for effect. When he says, sell your outer garment and buy a sword, he is not wanting them to sell their outer garments and buy a sword. It's, he is trying to underline the urgency of the crisis that's sweeping over them. Fighting about who's the most important, false bravado like uh, Peter, and now this business about thinking that well, the gospel somehow about buying swords, it just pr points, it underlines Jesus being alone again. He is not advocating violence. That's made very clear because in the next passage, Jesus rebukes his disciple who swings a sword and then heals the uh, servant of the high priest's ear. And then Jesus says, look at the last line, and he said to them, it is enough. Now, earlier commentators thought that it is enough as a response to the, look, we've got two swords. But that's not what it's about. Uh, almost everyone that I can find who's, uh, who, who understands this topic um, is, would, would say, no, what Jesus is doing here is cutting off a, a pointless conversation about swords. So uh, let me read it from the, the message, in the, in the message translation. They said, look, master, two swords. But Jesus said, enough of that, no more sword talk. That's probably a better translation. Jesus is just completely bewildered that again and again and again his disciples don't get it. So what emerges from all of these vignettes that I've been uh, hoping you'd see is Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples, his church, for the coming tsunami. And we're painted a picture of Jesus in complete sheer loneliness. He's by himself. There are times when Christian work for all of us carries a sense of this loneliness. Of course, nothing like what Jesus is experiencing, but we taste a little of it. Leadership during conflict, during construction projects, during times of major challenge or crisis or change, even as the church leads through times such as ours, COVID. Um, leaders feel a taste of loneliness. So for example, right now, you just can't please everybody when it comes to mask mandates. You can't please everybody about, about how the church should protect her people, how we should respond. You do your best to figure out what is the right thing to do, 
and you pray that people will be gracious. Verse 37 in that text, where Jesus says that he, what he is doing must be fulfilled. I wish that was a bigger slide. Uh, For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus is, um, I think I have, my slides are all black on here, so I can't tell what I'm seeing. Yes, good. Uh, Jesus knew that he in himself was acting out, behaving as living through the prophecy of the suffering servant in Isaiah chapters 40 to 55. If you want to do some homework, read Isaiah chapters 40 to 55. It's a great read. And it's, it, that, those, that section is all about, Jesus, all about the suffering servant. It's kind of a mysterious figure. The suffering servant is faithful Israel personified. And this particular piece I'm going to read to you now I'm going to read it because it's not in the text that I gave the lecture ahead of time. Um, This is from Isaiah chapter 53, and it's the passage, the particular piece that Jesus says I'm fulfilling. So in Isaiah 52, chapter uh, chapter 52, verses 11 to 13, Jesus says, Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see that he is the suffering servant. He shall see and be satisfied... By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Remember, this was written 700 years before Jesus was born. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death. I mean, Jesus in the garden is pouring out his soul to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So Jesus is numbered with the transgressors, and Jesus says this scripture needs to be fulfilled in me. So he's numbered with the transgressors in a bunch of ways. Here he is. Uh, being arrested like a common criminal by a gang with clubs and spears. Um, And he's counted among the transgressors when he's crucified between two thieves. And he makes intercession for the transgressors. Yes? Yeah, Joanne's asking, what does it mean numbered with the transgressors? What he's saying is he'll be looked upon as if he was one of the criminals, counted among. So when, you know, so the, the prophetic word from Isaiah was that the suffering servant who would redeem many and who would suffer for the people and would bring many to salvation, that suffering servant will be treated as though he was a criminal. And Jesus says, this is to be fulfilled right now in me. So there's irony, isn't there? Jesus numbered with the transgressors. He dies the death of a disgraceful criminal on a cross, and yet at the very moment when Jesus seems abandoned and defeated, he is achieving our salvation, fulfilling all the promises of Holy Scripture. Next reading, please. Luke 22, 39 to 42. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, 
but yours be done. As was his custom, verse at the beginning, as was his custom. This was a place where Jesus liked to go to pray. I can understand why. It's a peaceful, beautiful uh, garden in the, on the edge of a bustling city. It's a, it's a good place to pray and meditate, and it's filled with pilgrims today for that very reason. Judas, of course, would know where to find him. As was his custom means that Judas knew exactly where Jesus went to pray. It's about a 15-minute walk from the upper room on Mount Zion down the hill to, uh, and through the valley and uh, over to the Garden of Gethsemane. Verse 40, And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray with me that you may not enter into temptation. Now the word temptation can also be translated trial, and that's often, it's the same word that we have in the Lord's Prayer, Lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into trials. Um, and if you look down the very last sentence, um, he says, uh, well, now I've got two slides, and I'm, I'm dangerously... Yeah, the second... Uh, boy, I'm having trouble today. Yeah. And the passage ends with, rise up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So temptation is in both 46 and in 40. When you bracket a, a, a teaching with the same word or the same phrase, that's called in, in, in New Testament studies an inclusio. You've 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 have a word, a, a distinctive word, and a distinctive word, and in between you got a teaching, and it sort of identifies that block of teaching, and it also tells you what that teaching's about. <laughs> it's about the coming trial. Now, remember, I've been talking about how uh, Jesus is all alone and is. Disciples don't get this coming trial that's about to sweep over them. So that's the thrust of this. Um, um, what's the trial about? At one level, the primary, immediate level, is the trouble that's about to sweep over the Twelve and the Church. Um, at another level, the trial is the um, relates to the the Jewish understanding of the world was there was this present age and there's the age to come. And the two ages overlap and you and I live in them, live in the overlap. The overlap begins with the ministry of Jesus and it, return, it ends with the time of Jesus' return. So we live in this time between the times. <laughs> the old age is coming to an end and the new age has not yet begun and we live in that overlap. And the turmoil of that overlap is also the trial. So the trial includes the stresses and strains of trying to live a Christian life in a world that isn't a Christian world, for example. So it's us too, it's not just, but, but the immediate context is the trial of the crisis of Jesus' arrest. Jesus believed in this, under, understood the world in this way, with the old world order and the new world order and the overlap, but he believed and t taught that his appointed task was to enter into the darkness of this trial all by himself. That he would carry the fate of Israel himself uh, and take us through to the other side. He would face the trial alone, but the trial in both, both ways of understanding trial, he would face it alone. And that's why in verse 53, when they arrest him, he's, we haven't got there yet, he says to the crowd who've come to arrest him, your moment has come. Uh, and he goes on to talk about the power of darkness. It's in, in this power of darkness, Jesus is all alone. Verse 42, do, I think we have it up there. I can't go back and forth easily. It's, it's just too confusing because I can't see what slide I'm looking at. There we are. Um, Verse 42, having predicted his passion, Jesus now seems to shrink from it. Uh, you know, he, he's in the garden on his knees, and he, and he says, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And it seems that Jesus, who has predicted his passion repeatedly, seems to be, now that he's very close to it, shrinking from it. The... 
gospel writers, and particularly Luke, want us to show the mental anguish that Jesus is experiencing here. It's here in the garden that Jesus, who has turned his face toward the cross, comes face to face as a human being, as a man, with the ugly thing that's about to happen. And in a very human way, he says to the Father, if there be some other way, tell me. Remember the passage, that what's going on here? Jesus is living through the story of Abraham and Isaac, and Abraham was called to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And just as the knife is in the air and he's about to bring the knife down to obey God's word to him, horrible story, right? But, that, but just as Isaac is, has the knife in the air, he sees a lamb caught in a thicket. And God tells him, don't lay a hand on your boy. The lamb is the substitute. And so there is Jesus in the garden. And he can't help but think of that moment and wonder if maybe at the last minute God's got another way, another way that doesn't involve him having to suffer in the agony of crucifixion. There are two verses, verse 42 and 43. Um, the, the verse about um, the angel and the verse about his bloody sweat in the garden. And those two verses are missing from some translations of the Bible. I don't know what translation you're using, but there are a number of translations that either don't include verse 42 or 43 or put it in the margin or in brackets. Um, and that's because it's missing from some of the oldest manuscripts. The consensus opinion is those verses belong in the Bible and they are part of Luke's original uh, writing. And they were left out because people were troubled by the idea of an angel strengthening God. If, God, if Jesus is God, why does he need a, an angel to help him out? Um, and uh, the other bit about the bloody sweat, I'm not sure. Maybe it was also showing Jesus true humanity and some elements in the early church were really troubled by passages where Jesus was shown as human. The Gnostic tendency was to show Jesus as totally divine, sort of floating above human trouble. And these two passages make Jesus very human. Um, the two sentences, the angel's role, strengthening Jesus and the bloody sweat taken together, underline the anguish that Jesus is undergoing. Here in the garden, Jesus knows now that the cup will not be taken away. The other thing that commenters, commentators remark about this passage is that it probably is not death itself that is troubling Jesus. It's the nature of the death he's about to die. Uh, first, he will be made sin for us. Aha. Uh -huh. I've got it, I think. So, in... There's this... I'm going to forget about that. It's just not working for me. Um, the nature of Jesus' death is what's causing him uh, to have this great angst. First, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're told that Jesus will be made sin for us. That is to say... The passage says, he who knew no sin was made sin so that we may be made the righteousness of God. There's this divine trade going on. Jesus' righteousness is being given to us and our sin is being given to Jesus. And at the moment Jesus dies on the cross, he is he has absorbed all the sin of the world. And because he's now the sin bearer, he is now... Uh, the father turns his face away. The father cannot be in the presence of evil. So Jesus knows that in his dying, something horrible is going to happen. There's going to be this horrible moment when he will be absolutely, utterly alone, even, for the, even bereft of the father's presence. Um, that's why Jesus on the cross says... Um, um, the cry of a dereliction, the cry of abandonment. Why have you forsaken me? Yeah, 
Father, uh, Lord, Lord, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, some would say he's citing the Psalms. But Jesus, at that moment on the cross, and we'll get to that in a couple weeks, he is fully experiencing the, the, the world's most profound form of loneliness. So he, the sinless one, is bearing the sin of the world. He, I mean, what an awful thought to have to bear all the sin of the world in yourself and then have the Father turn his face away. And that is probably what's going on here. And of course, the last verse of this passage is um, Jesus finds his disciples sleeping, so that, again, underlining how alone Jesus is. Next reading, please. I haven't read 43 to 46. Do you want me to do that or not? And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Um, so just to underline, uh, the disciples are sleeping and uh, Jesus is going through torment. And Luke is helping us to understand how alone Jesus is. Next, please. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Thank you, Mary. So the scene is uh, continuous from his praying to his being arrested. While he was still speaking is interesting. If you recall, the last thing Jesus was saying was urging his disciples to pray. So he's urging people to pray, and while he's calling his 12 to pray, the, the, the mob scene happens. In come, in come the uh, temple guards led by none other than his friend Judas. And Jesus confronts two groups here, one at a time, or two individuals. First, he confronts Judas. Before Judas actually kisses him, and it, the text doesn't say that Judas came out and kissed him. That's what is said in, in Mark. Uh, it's, it, in this case, Judas is leading the, the, the arresting party toward Jesus, and Jesus just speaks to him and rebukes him and says, you would betray uh, me with a kiss, which is to, to underline the... <laughs> The, the horrible irony. I mean, a kiss on the cheeks or on both cheeks within that society was a very normal way for family members and close friends to greet one another, uh, men, of course, as well as women. And to use this sign of intimate friendship as the way to identify the man to arrest, it's just the ultimate hypocrisy and the ultimate act of betrayal. And Jesus rebukes uh, Judas. And then, of course, he rebukes the arresting party. He says to them, you know, I've been uh, preaching every day in the temple. I mean, you know, and you know that uh, I, I'm not armed. You don't have to come out against me like I'm a brigand of some sort. Um, why have you done this in the dark? It's because 
you guys are captive to the forces of darkness. Your, your hearts aren't right. You're carrying on the work of the enemy, arresting Messiah and about to kill him in the holy city for doing nothing other than bringing the people closer to God. And then, of course, there's this moment where one of the 12, not identified in Luke, but identified in Mark as, as Peter, swings the sword, cuts off the high priest's ear. Jesus rebukes the use of violence, tells him to stop, and then he uh, uh, heals the injured man, and uh, Jesus is taken away under arrest. And uh, we will see next week how the story continues, but the, it's like the disciples just disappear from the scene. It's all about Jesus and the series of trials that are going to take place now. Um, so off we go now, please, to small groups. Mary, uh, you say it's of all the things I do as a pastor, um, teaching scriptures one of my favorite activities and uh, to actually have the time to devote to study and teaching of scripture maybe a day and a half a week in my life right now it's kind of, it's a real privilege so and i it's no fun doing it by myself so thank you for coming and being part of this um, so we follow jesus uh, from uh, on his journey through Jericho and to uh, the Mount of Olives and to uh, into the city of Jerusalem to the Temple Mount and then to Mount Zion and for the for the Last Supper and today from Mount Zion back down through the Kidron Valley to Gethsemane and now Jesus has been arrested so next week when we gather we'll be at Caiaphas's house. Um, you want to read ahead if you can, please. In Luke, reread uh, chapter 22 and chapter 23 and uh, kind of get the story in your head again. But we're going to the, the high priest Caiaphas' house. It's a place that we go to uh, when we tour the Holy Land. And it's, there's a new church built on top of it over the ruins of an ancient church, over the ruins of Caiaphas' house, the high priest's house. <laughs> They've unearthed it. And... One of the things that always astonishes me about that place is what does a high priest need a dungeon in his basement for? You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's bizarre, isn't it? But part of the, uh, the, the, the building that we'll see next week is a hole in the floor about this big around. And uh, they would lower somebody down with a rope. There's no other way out or in of that room. They lower the prisoner down on a rope and then they pull the rope back up. And uh, that's in the basement of the, of the high priest's house. And we'll be there a week today uh, when we uh, look at the, Peter's denial and, his, and the beginning of his trials, the, uh, the, the actual judicial process, that they, the mock trials, really. And then the following week, we'll, we'll do the Via Dolorosa, the uh, trial before Pilate and Jesus being condemned. And then on April 13, Wednesday and Holy Week will be as Jesus is crucified between two criminals. And uh, the last week of our study, the, the, sun, the Wednesday after Easter, uh, will be on the road to Emmaus. It's a resurrection story, and it's, uh, it's a suitable Easter story. Um, are there any questions that I could answer now? Yes, John. That's a good good question, and I don't know the answer. I don't think I don't have the answer. Um, my my instinct is that the Holy Spirit's helping. Here are some results from a search. <laughs> so now I guess uh, 
Siri, is, Siri knows the answer to your question, John. You know? <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> you see? Well, that day will come. Uh, I would say the authors, we believe that the writers of the, of the Bible's books, they're human, and yet behind every human author lies God the Holy Spirit. So it's God's book written by God's people, inspired by God's spirit. And as they write, I think we're, we can, we're, we're, the theological position we take is that God guided the, the mind of Luke to write that. And how Luke knew it, I don't know. Um, in a, you know, our modern scientific mind asks questions like that. That's an engineering question or a scientific question, isn't it? Um, it's, uh, but I don't have the answer, I'm sorry. I, I wish I did. It's one of those questions that we'll ask uh, the Lord when we see him face to face. Another question that was raised earlier is the question about what's this cup that Jesus says, if, this, if, if possible, take this cup from me. In Jeremiah and in Isaiah, Isaiah and in other Old Testament prophets, the cup is often the cup of wrath or the cup of God's anger that needs to be dealt with. So he, Jesus really recognizes that the problem he's dealing with is the division between God and God's people caused by human sin. And this cup is, is the weight of the sin of the world that Jesus has to bear. I know there was other questions. Yes, Mary. Yes, it's chapter 45 to 53 is the whole section, but most important would be chapter 52 and 53. Isaiah 52 and 53 are the, what we call the servant song. And when you read Isaiah 52 and 53 and realize it was written six or 700 years before Jesus was born, you kind of say to yourself, oh my goodness, <laughs> the, the whole story of the passion is spelled out in poetry but, it, I mean, it just you just know that this is about Jesus. Yes, Wendy. I found very thoughtful questions on the other side. And on the eighth one, it's interesting that Jesus is the one who is the one who is the one who is the one who is the one Well, I think the scriptures sort of hold that... The Father is spirit, you know, uh, when he wants to come in the flesh, he sends Jesus or he sends the Holy Spirit. So it's, I mean, and an angel, the word angelos, in the word we, from which we get angel, means messenger. And, and actually, early in the, Old, in the Old Testament, the word, the angel of God and God seem to merge. It's almost like when God sends an angel, God has come, him, come himself. It's the voice of God expressed through an angelic being. I think that's what's going on here. So it is God the Father comforting Jesus. Um, and, and it's interesting, one of the things that came up in the discussion in the group I was with uh, was the notion that uh, um, Every other place angels show up, they almost always start out saying, fear not. It's like the angel's presence brings fear. The angel's presence doesn't bring holy awe to Jesus. He's, he's, it brings Jesus a sense of, of knowing that God the Father is with him and that he's doing God's will. And he's strengthened by, by the presence of the angel so that he can resist Satan in prayer. I mean, Jesus resists the temptation to cut and run by, by prayer. And the prayer is strengthened by the presence of God's angel. Well, I hope that helps. Any other questions, thoughts? Yes, sure. sure. John's question, yes. Yes, um, 
I think I heard your question. So Jesus has been to this place in the garden many times before. It's as his, is his usual, it says in the text. So this was his particular prayer place. And because of that, Judas would have been very familiar with it. There was another place on the, on, the, on the Mount of Olives where Jesus and his disciples often gathered. That's just a little further up the hill. And that's the place they call Eleona, where Jesus apparently, where tradition holds, Jesus taught them the Lord's Prayer. So there were particular places. And they were known to the Twelve, and they were certainly known to uh, Judas. Is that the question? Yeah. Any, anybody else, friends? Well, this has been great and wonderful, and I look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you all.